Well, this, this event came about in an unusual way. I wrote a blog post for the Survival Editor's blog um, about a month ago on the anniversary of D-Day. Um, I read an interesting piece uh, discussing um, some s samples of sand that had been taken from Omaha Beach, and in the analysis they discovered that about 4% of the material was actually microscopic shell fragments and fused material from explosions left over from, uh, at the time the sample was taken, from about 50 years earlier. Um, so I wrote a, a, a short piece um, talking about the environmental legacy of war uh, in the context of D-Day and broader issues like depleted uranium and um, landmines and unexploded ordnance and things like that. Um, but it's not a topic that I've thought in great depth about, and the IISS has not done uh, any work on it. Um, but uh, Doug Weir from the Toxic Remnants of War Project contacted me, having read that post, sent me a advanced copy of their uh, latest report, which they launched last night. Um, and I found this interesting enough that I thought it would make a good um, discussion event here at IISS. Uh, there are a lot of um, issues, uh, scientific, um, technical, uh, environmental and legal around the toxic remnants of war, and um, uh, Anika and Doug are going to be talking uh, about a lot of them. I'm not sure exactly uh, uh, what they're going to cover today. Um, they will each talk for about 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll have um, plenty of time for a discussion. And I'm with a relatively small number of people, unfortunately, but it should give us um, an opportunity for, for more in-depth um, and detailed and stimulating discussion afterwards. So, no. Oh, Annika's going to speak. Um, yeah, thank you, Jeffrey, very much for providing this opportunity to speak here, and thank you, Penny. Um, so, um, I'm the author of the latest report, Pollution Politics, and my um, presentation is going to give a broad sort of uh, overview of the, the arguments that I present, but because it's quite a broad-ranging um, piece, and I'm going to have to be brief and be very welcome to sort of talk in more detail about any of the points I've been up at the end of the at the end of the talk. Um, so just firstly to get into the rationale, when we were looking at the toxic remnants of war issue, we realised the two key questions that came up were where does where does responsibility lie for this issue, and, and who's paying. So we're doing a three-year project, and this this report is part of the first year um, of the project. So firstly, just to get the definitions, we all know where we're at. Um, toxic remnants of war are any toxic or radiological substance resulting from munitions or military activities that forms a hazard to human or environmental health. Now, when I first started looking into this, I realised this could be quite broad and we need to sort of classify and define a little bit more what toxic remnants of war are to sort of start thinking about things like accountability. So we came up with two classifications, direct toxic remnants of war and indirect. So direct toxic remnants are ones that are the immediate result of military activity. So for example, in peacetime, this might mean weapons testing and sort of um, particulates left in the firing ranges or going to groundwater from, from those sorts of activities. Um, during wartime, um, targeting decisions, so targeting of industrial sites or particular bombing within urban areas, um, and as well as munitions use, it's a lot wider than particular toxic substances within the munitions that also involves other, other toxic hazards that are released during the conduct of warfare. Um, and in post-conflict times, things like conflict waste and rubble, so you know, abandoned tanks or abandoned military materials, hazardous waste disposal that are sort of in the domain of military bases and how to deal with that. Um, but I also found a lot, of, a, a lot of my research came from the United Nations Environment Programme reports, um, on particular sort of post-conflict environment assessments they've undertaken in Iraq and Gaza and Lebanon. And I found there was a significant um, case for looking at indirect toxic remnants of war. So these are the consequences of the events or conditions connected to conflict or instability, often conflict leads to breakdown of institutions, which can lead to further problems. So for example, um, in Iraq, uh, UNEP wrote this hotspots report where it looked at industrial sites and the fact that after the 2003 invasion, lots of those sites were left unsecured and unguarded, which meant that locals would go into them to loot barrels or, or other materials. And in one case, a lot of barrels were looted from a uh, nuclear facility that contained uranium ox oxide. People didn't know this and used them for water containers. So, you know, there's kind of real, real risks 
from the abandonment of these hazardous sites, and if they're not properly looked into, if they're not properly security, can lead to significant humanitarian harm. Um, so that's kind of the scope of what Tox Around War includes to us. So through my research, I looked at five key problems. Um, a weak legal regime, and uh, I'll go into more details to what I mean by this, uh, military behaviour, an electoral approach, the limited visibility and recognition of toxic rents of war, and limited state capacity. So the weak legal regime, um, as, as you probably know, there's three major bodies of law relevant to war. Um, the first is IHR and Sashimitarian law, which is mostly seen as a sort of main body of law relating to, relating to war, sorry, main body of law. Um, However, recently, um, it's also been accepted that human rights law and environmental treaties can also be applicable during conflict. Um, so when I say limited protection provided by IHL, what I mean by this is the environmental protection is one key um, direct protection provision. That's the, uh, I can't remember the exact de Article 35, perhaps, or Protocol 1. Um, and in that, there's a high threshold of harm. So any environmental damage needs to be long-term, widespread, and severe to be in breach of IHL. And now those terms aren't defined, and lots of work done by scholars has shown that lots of key events, so for example, the Iraqi oil well fires or the bombing of a petrochemical plant in um, Serbia during the Kosovo War, didn't fulfill that high threshold of harm. Those were significant events that caused widespread to commence, um, contamination. So when I'm talking about gaps within IHL, that's kind of the significant gap that you know, the United Nations Environment Programme, the International Law Commission, Special um, Independent Expert, Mary Jacobson, as well as numerous legal scholars are all un in consensus on there isn't an adequate protection there. There are indirect um, environmental provisions. There are in indirect provisions within IHL. So, for example, um, the principle of proportionality, the principle for indirect suffering, that could um, indirectly provide protection for the environment and human health. Now, these are all weighed up against military necessity. And so there, you know, there's this balance with an IHL of, um, of the military need, the strategic need for an action versus, you know, environmental need. You know, a lot of the work that Karen Hughes has done, if anyone has seen that, she's developed a book in 2007, really examines those, detail, those protections in detail. And while they do provide some protection, um, as of yet within international law, like within courts, it's, it's shown that there's a struggle to to sort of combat the military necessity argument in the IHL. And this is something that human rights law, because it protects the rights of the human, as opposed to regulating war, if you're looking from a humanitarian perspective, could provide a lot more sort of um, support. But there it's about how to make that applicable on the ground. And um, similarly with environmental law. In addition, I've only talked about conduct during war, so there's also conduct before war and post-conflict. And there are also two areas of um, of this, of this issue that humanitarian, um, human rights law and environmental law could have more of an impact on. Like, for example, in humanitarian law, there's a clear bearer of the duty of rights to the state to provide for its citizens and ensure that they have access to a healthy environment, access to work, access to food, all things that are impacted by touching to war. But, you know, we have a clear, um, a clear angle and responsibility, but then it's about providing them with assistance and capacity to be able to withhold those rights. Um, so military behaviour. So as I've already sort of hinted at, uh, mission success takes priority for militaries, and that's obviously a given. That's their role. Um, so in that regard, it's about trying to strengthen international law to ensure that certain certain behaviours or certain particularly damaging um, conduct is off limits. So we already have um, the article on dangerous forces, so it's illegal to. Um, destroy or bomb nuclear facilities, dams or dikes, I think, is that right? Um, now, if that was expanded to looking at industrial facilities or other sort of particularly damaging um, targets that have particular humanitarian impact, that might help. Um, however, so moving on though, I'm getting, I'm getting a bit too detailed on all these points, but it's only got 50 minutes. Um, <laughs> another key problem, and, and this comes mostly from looking at Duty availability of information, US work in um, US um, coalition forces activity in Iraq, is a poor environmental ethic. So, there, there's been a lot of research done by the Rand Corporation in the US, as well as the Government Accountability Office in the US, that really examines in detail the conduct of officers and also structural problems within the US Army. And there is a right through, um, in particular, in dealing with conflict waste, that there was a poor ethic 
and it didn't get translated. There's also a limited capacity for environmental expertise and bases that led to increasing problems. So while there's mission success that often takes priority, there are a lot of CRW issues that could be solved through better environmental ethic, through military behaviour. Um, but that, that means we've got a lot of work at the moment. There's also peacetime research on toxics, particularly in the US and, and also in Finland and some European, some European um, military. This is really useful stuff, you know, the first time we're getting real detailed information on, um, on trying, to try to investigate the environmental impact of particular mission, mission use. Now, while this, while this is good, it does lack a civilian focus because obviously the drivers are firing range sustainability and troop health, and a lot of it is looking at, for example, the, the risks of um, munitions use at the firing point as opposed to where the, where the munitions end up. And so if you're looking at it from a humanitarian perspective, which we are, then you know this works good, but we need to build on it really and, and bring in the civilian focus. So the inequitable approach. Um, the, main, the key finding of this report was that due to the fact that we have a weak legal, legal regime, the response um, and sort of responsibility taken by militaries and governments to TRW um, is ad hoc. Often it's taken when there's an operational or diplomatic need for, for action on it. Um, and due to this, due to the um, sort of imbalance of power structures, it, this allows law to be utilised when it suits powerful actors, um, leaving less powerful actors a lack of access to redress. So I'll just go into this in a little more detail. So, for example, um, Agent Orange was used in the Vietnam, in the Vietnam War, I'm sure everyone's aware of it, um, which released quite um, potent dioxins into the environment, impacting sort of environment and human health for decades. Um, only recently has the US, through um, USAID, started to support the clearance of, of Agent Orange in Vietnam, which is, is great news for, for those in those communities. Now, the context of this is that since 1994, the US and Vietnamese um, governments have been trying to improve relations um, between them. And the Vietnamese, obviously, Agent Orange was a massive sore point. Um, and so they've been pushing for the US to clean up. And, and because of the US's want to exercise power in, in Southeast Asia and the, you know, the growth of the sort of growing influence of China, they're more um, compelled to bend on the issue of Agent Orange and support cleanup. However, you know, Agent Orange was also used in Vietnam and Laos, and it, they are, they, there isn't the same attitude towards clearance there. Um, and also, you can see from their sort of approach to human health, um, they, they, they sort of explicit stuff in Congress reports about not wanting to be held responsible or accountable um, for compensating um, Agent Orange victims. They're very, very willing to give humanitarian aid because obviously they gave aid to some things, they uh, admit liability to some, and to like, admit, admit, admit liability to all, and therefore, you know, it's, it's very expensive um, and also has implications down the line. Um, coming back to looking at how law is interpreted, um, this is a table, I don't know if you can see it very well from where you are, but it's um, comparing um, the Gulf War uh, and the particular incident of the oil well fires where the Iraqi forces um, uh, released masses of oil spills and satellite, um, various oil well fires alike. Lebanon War where Israeli forces bombed um, the GRG power station which contained lots of oil and caused massive oil spills and lots of air pollution. And the Kosovo War where NATO bombed a petrochemical plant outside Panchevo, releasing lots of chemicals and toxic stuff into the Danube River but also major air pollution. Um, so in each case significant environmental harm was created. Um, this, lots of this information is taken from Karen Hume's work um, but the in direct environmental <coughs> provisions I mentioned earlier, the high threshold of harm, in neither of those cases, in any, none of those cases, that, that threshold wasn't breached. Um, whether indirect environmental provisions are breached, uh, in the Gulf War, um, work there showed that they had been breached in wanting damage, so those regulations against not um, committing damage without any sort of major damage without any strategic need. Um, however, in the Lebanese uh, case and in the Kosovo case, I put a question up there because in the Lebanon, in the Lebanese case, it was the whether any indirect prevention of environmental provisions of breach was not assessed. There's a potential that this the action was disproportionate to the advantage gained. There's a potential that it was caused indiscriminate harm. However, because of the lack of assessment, you know, these haven't been able to be you know, taken through. Um, in the Kosovo War, again, 
the um, International Criminal Tribunal of Yugoslavia um, stated that there was, they did look at the issue, however, they said there wasn't enough evidence to assess if the proportionality rule had been breached because they didn't have enough evidence on understanding the military strategic need of bombing the of bombing of bomb because the military were willing to release that information. Therefore, this is why I was explaining earlier the difficulty of using IHL to create proper protection provision because you've got these arguments that, you know, and you've got the lack of information, lack of transparency there. Um, were any of these cases tested in international court? Um, neither the Gulf War or Lebanese case have, and in Kosovo, the ICJ um, looked into um, the, the case brought to the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, but it was dismissed because the US and then Spain didn't um, uh, didn't recognise the jurisdiction of the court, and the other applicants, um, Serbia and Montenegro, wasn't uh, able. I can't, I can't, what was the exact wording? They weren't um, they weren't privy to court. I think something about signing up. They would have prima facie. I can't remember the exact words, but. Basically, the court decided it couldn't look at the case. Um, were reparations sought? In each case, um, the affected party did look for resolution, did did call for compensation. Um, in the Gulf case, in the Gulf War case, this was granted through a UN Security Council resolution. Um, in the Lebanese case, they they gone to the UN General Assembly with many resolutions. However, Israel's obviously said. No, we're not going to. We're not going to give you any compensation. And the Kosovan case, as I've said, they went to the ICJ and the ICTY, and that wasn't successful either. Um, so that show gives you a bit of a picture of lots of the politics around how to interpret war and how affected states and communities have access to to reparations. And the fact that there is major gaps um, in this. So the second thing, the the, the next problem is the limited visibility and, rec and recognition. A lot of the stuff I've just talked about is sort of big ticket stuff. It's sort of big bombings that get a lot of attention and it's clear to see uh, the sort of belligerent or the, the cause of the problem and the, the, the recipient. Um, but what my research finds is a lot of complexity in, in conflict environments. So for example, uh, the Philippine Iraq War again, um, as I said there's sort of management problems, um, managing industrial sites, ensuring that they're you know, not accessed by locals. There's sort of waste, waste disposal systems breaking down. A lot of this is the indirect TRW stuff. Um, there's the clearance of, of demolition rubble that might contain asbestos or lead paint or heavy metal particulates or energetic material, TNT or RDX from munitions. Um, and a lot of this, it's a sh there's a shared responsibility here. It's not as simple as a belligerent, um, belligerent fault. But it, it, because they're, some of these issues are, are more mundane, they've got less visibility, and therefore less recognition, less assistance, and also more difficult. Um, to take the right child, but this is where human rights law, environmental law, might be more um, more useful uh, to take a more holistic approach to civilian sort of um, health. And continuing this, recognising affected persons. So obviously, a large problem we have with public health problems is proving causality. We've sort of seen this um, for decades. You would defeat your Indian It's really hard to prove that that particular health outcome has come from a particular source and this is due to the complexity of human bodies, the complexity of, of chemicals and the way they interact in the environment. Um, there's also massive data gaps, as you can imagine, in post-conflict environments. There's no accurate health monitoring records. Um, there's there's problems of even getting into insecure um, like places in Spitzel. We're trying to do some work in Syria at the moment and there's just lots of problems of even getting in to do some of this work to assess, to assess the situation. And also in Iraq, we've seen a lot of politicisation of data. Um, however, it's interesting note, to note that this problem of causality has been circumvented in some cases. So in 1991, the American government passed the Agent Orange Act, and this um, act coined, well, used the term presumptive diseases. It took a presumptive disease approach. So the Institute of Medicine in the US um, analysed dioxin exposure and what that might do to your health, and it came up with a list of diseases that could be associated with Agent Orange exposure. Um, and any veterans who set foot on Vietnamese soil during the war and had any of these diseases were then, through this act, able to get compensation. So essentially, it, um, it circumvented this need to prove exposure. Um, but that hasn't translated to looking at civilians, um, and that's a, a key issue. Um, so there are ways around it, and I don't think we need to necessarily go down the route of you need to prove harm. Um, I mean, you need to prove exposure because 
that's incredibly complex and um, yeah, from a humanitarian perspective, a, a bit of a, a large ask. So finally, um, limited state capacity is a final problem. Uh, Post-conflict states are often firefighting or dealing with a number of urgent problems that all rightly gain um, are, are sort of looking for attention. Um, and top tolerance of war are one part of that story, and this is why quite often toxic issues are left, you know, often seen as a long-term issue and you know, dealing with refugees are dealing with the sort of results of the space of violence take precedent. However, these sort of initial, you know, um, the action in the days and weeks and months directly after events can have a long-term impact and there needs to be more attention to how that can be better, better looked at. Um, it's also massive issues of limited capacity, so this is financial capacity, infrastructure, institutional um, capacity and expertise. Particularly with talks of war, there's, you know, you're dealing with um, hazardous waste quite often and you need special, uh, particular infrastructure to deal with hazardous waste. Quite often, many post conflict states don't have the access to this infrastructure. Um, or even simple things like in Gaza, the need for you know, the need high reach cranes, which we take for granted in all over London, um, to, to, to adequately um, deal with hanging rubble. So, bombed out buildings have half of the roofs fallen in, but because they don't have high reach cranes, this, these sorts of um, this rubble remains intact and kids play all over it. And, like I said before, there are lots of potential contaminants and foreign shoe nets sort of assessed on this building level. Um, so it's quite simple equipment sometimes is lacking in, in post conflict states. And finally, as well as as well as troops and veterans being exposed, in the civilian population, the most vulnerable bear the burden. So it's women, children, elderly and disabled are often most at risk from from toxic substances through their health and their ability to deal with these things. So I will go through these quickly because I think I've kind of got it across in what I've said so far, but Gaps in law. So there are currently few obligations in a party to a conflict to protect, prevent, um, and restore conflict related environmental damage. There's gaps in existing IHL provisions due to high threshold. There's problems of implementation enforcement of existing relevant IHL provisions, and this is sort of wider than environmental provisions in itself, but that's the case. Um, there's questions around responsibility during internal conflict. A lot of the stuff we talked about is international conflict, but internal conflict is a massive grey zone of international law that's really lots of. Lots of uh, Legal scholars and you know the ISO really struggle with um, and we struggle with too. Um, there's a lack of clarity in the applicability and implementation of human rights and environmental law, but this is something that we can definitely work on and provide sort of a place of optimism. A recognition of civilian presumptive diseases, um, the need for reparation mechanisms or some sort of um, increasing assistance for environmental and civilian harm. And looking at the post conflict response. Um, there's an ad hoc approach to responsibility and limited capacity, which leaves a significant gap in the resolution of to war. There's a lack of data, um, the limited capacity building. While UNEP's done a lot of work here, but what's needed is far greater than what's available in terms of systems. So there's an opportunity for lots of more actors working on this issue, um, but we really need to build attention to make sure this happens. Um, and also the need of um, humanitarian organisations and peace building organisations have environmental pra best practice in their work in addition. Um, and also an increase in funding. So solutions, we need to recognise the problem, we need to realise that conflict, ha like environmental damage and conflict is a humanitarian issue um, and toxic remnants of war casualties are casualties of war and this needs to be um, recognised. Um, we need to prioritise monitoring without information, without data on health, public health monitoring and environmental monitoring. Um, it's hard to it's hard to then, that's a prerequisite, a prerequisite to accountability and to visibility of the issue. Um, we need to minimise and regulate community practices. Obviously, the best way of reducing this is at source, so if we can work on military conduct um, and munitions use, uh, that's obviously far less expensive than dealing with it after war. And without, uh, without some international process to ensure um, sort of across the board best behaviour, the, you know, the results are inequitable. Certain, you know, those with most power will be able, those with most access to political power have most have most access to um, to support, uh, and, and that's from a sort of environmental justice perspective, humanitarian perspective, isn't isn't enough. So we need some sort of international process. Thank you very much. Okay, thank. You. Um, I think the whole discussion until after. Uh, that's
go through swiftly, I guess. Um, soon. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about why now is quite a good time and some of the things which are happening in parallel to the work we're doing and also a little bit about our work and I'll try and avoid too much crossover with what uh, Anik has already talked about for the sake of brevity. Um, so just briefly about us, we launched the project in 2012 and it was a project by the International Coalition to Ban Uranium Weapons and uh, Dutch organisation PAX. And we've been working on depleted uranium for a long time, and it was clear that a lot of the issues associated with DU, such as how substances and munitions are assessed for safety prior to use, uh, post-conflict environmental assessment, post-conflict public health monitoring, responsibility for cleaning up environmental contaminants were not only true for DU, but also true for a range of other substances and practices. So it made sense to cast the nets a little bit wider and take this sort of topic as a whole. So we were keen to explore the extent of civilian harm from environmental pollution uh, caused by military activities, uh, examine the existing legal provisions for protection, and also consider whether emerging humanitarian environmental principles could improve civilian environmental protection and uh, kind of anthropocentric approach to protection of the environment. Yes. Um, yeah probably didn't need a diagram, but it's a fairly simple assessment, but in order to protect civilians, you need to ensure protect the environment uh, that they live, with, live, work and play in. Um, so some of the wider context, uh, back in 2009, UN Environment Programme published a very major study uh, on relevant legal frameworks uh, for during armed conflict protection of the environment, and yeah, issued 12 pretty good recommendations as Anika's sort of discussed, there's huge holes in there currently, uh, which go far beyond just the thresholds for determining uh, what is and what isn't acceptable damage to the environment. Um, and this then fed into a study the ICRC were doing, uh, which was looking at four different areas of ways to improve IHL, one of which was protection of the environment. And some of their key findings were that uh, international environmental law has very much outpaced IHL, and certainly with regard to conflict in the environment, very little has been done since the post-Vietnam era, era 1970s or so. The NMOD Convention was the last sort of substantive piece of regulation, and that was primarily aimed at fairly science fiction stuff about <coughs> manipulating the environment as a weapon of war. Um, they found that conflict pollutants threatened civilians, and also that environmental damage increases the vulnerability post-conflict, and they called for it to be addressed. Uh, the really good recommendations in there on a new mechanism with obligations on assessment, uh, assistance and monitoring of infringements. Um, and the sort of outpacing of IHL by international environmental law strikes to the heart of what we're doing because we're looking quite closely at whether peacetime environmental and public health protection norms could be applied and could help inform improvements in protection of civilians during and after conflict that a civilian is much the same as a citizen when it comes to their need for uh, protection from environmental pollutants. Uh, some of the unit recommendations then were partly a trigger for the International Law Commission to take up the topic. Um, they established a special rapporteur last year and she's conducting a three-year review which is looking at relevant law before, during and after armed conflict. She has a new report out uh, start of next month, I think, um, which looks at some of the key principles from different legal regimes. Um, during her work, she's going to have a special focus on non-state actors and non-international armed conflicts, which is very welcome because it's a bit of a somewhat more of a grey area when it comes to relevant law, despite the fact that most conflicts currently uh, fall under that bracket. Uh, there's also been work done at the UN Human Rights Council with some of their special rapporteurs, um, one in 2007, which uh, discussed quite broadly uh, toxic products and the risks to uh, human health and that also at conflict and found that there were grave and long-term impacts to the enjoyment of human rights. Currently, there's uh, an expert, John Knox, who's also doing work on the interactions between environmental law and human rights law, and showing that human rights law includes obligations relating to the environment, such as uh, a human right to know what contaminants are in your environment and to be able to seek legal redress and uh, response to pollution issues. Um, so against that background, we've been working, calling for a new approach, and you know, it's very clear that conflict's always going to be polluting, but the question is, could best practice and new mechanisms make it less so, the aim being to reduce harm and improve post-conflict response? Um, again, current IHL provisions for protection of the environment are very much unfit for purpose, but uh, there's lots of interesting bits and pieces that could be taken from human rights and environmental law. 
uh, and also peacetime norms and standards that could help inform a new approach or improve practice. Why toxic remnants of war? Um, not enough attention is given to them, but they're common to many conflicts. It's never really came under a single bracket uh, or single definition before. You know, as Anika has discussed, there are a range of different pollution problems that are common to conflict, and maybe if you can bundle them all together, you might be able to make some progress on them. Um, conflict in the environment is pretty vast. And you obviously do your conflict and climate change, but there's also work being done on environmental peace building and natural resource management and things, so it's complementary to these other approaches around conflict in the environment. Um, there's also increasing civil and military awareness of toxics regulation and health and environmental protection, and we've seen that from forces health protection perspective, from uh, sustainable base and range management, um, but also looking at uh, civil toxics regulation work, such as the REACH system within the European Union, which aims to reduce toxics over consumer goods. And then finally, need to protect civilians and aid sustainable post-conflict recovery. Um, as a cross-cutting issue, it throws up some quite interesting opportunities from a diplomatic perspective. We've been having some interesting discussions in Geneva and New York, and um, there seems to be some interest in approaching these cross-cutting issues that cut across disarmament, environment and human rights, and also from our perspective as civil society. You know, we're cross-cutting public health development, environmental advocacy, and also humanitarian disarmament, so we work on landmines, cluster munitions, and munitions topics. Um, early this year, the our first couple of years have basically been a scoping exercise to see if there was enough here to actually uh, form an initiative on. And uh, yeah, I think there's definitely enough for a, a significant body of work. And we established a new network, civil society network, uh, earlier this year with various folk who've been active in landmines and cluster munitions. And we're reaching out to environmental organisations and public health organisations to carry work forward. We have a, a network call where we're we can see that uh, quality print acknowledgement that military practices and materials should not be completely exempted from standards and norms established to protect human and environmental health. And this is quite common in a lot of uh, toxics regulations that there tend to be blanket exemptions for military materials, such as the recent Mercury Convention contains a blanket exemption for any military use of mercury. Uh, and it's this sense and culture of exceptionalism which we're seeking to challenge a little in this. Um, so calling for a review of policies and practices to avoid the generation of toxic remnants. Um, importantly, to try and encourage more rigorous assessments of uh, environmental damage and pollution, which may impact uh, civilian health, and also more obligations, clearer obligations for cooperation and assistance, and generally improve legal protection for civilians, military personnel, and the environment, which, yeah, as objectives, would be addressing this imbalance between peacetime health and environmental protection, Constructively reviewing current practices that lead to generation of TRW. Um, importantly, to try and diversify the number of actors who are doing environmental monitoring and recording data, including empowering communities themselves to be able to record data and work towards some kind of mechanism at some distant point in the future. Um, so briefly, yeah, addressing conflict pollution, improve protection of civilians and the environment. There's a lot of attention from international organisations and also the environmental awareness within the military itself uh, is creating a vehicle for progress and for debate. There are legal principles and civil norms that can offer a useful toolbox for informing a future approach and uh, emerging humanitarian environmental considerations creates opportunities for engagement and as civil society we'd argue that we have an important role to play <laughs> in any process. Uh, so yeah. Be about it. So we've got a website, toxicremnantsofwar.info, um, which is kind of a research hub, and on there we've got our toxics blog, which various blogs exploring uh, some of the issues we've touched on, and others. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I've got a couple of questions and comments, but I'll hold them and I'll, I'll open it to, uh, to the floor. Um, and you mentioned that there was limited, you, in your uh, talk, went through some big ticket items like mm. the oil well parts in Iraq and Lebanon and Egypt and Vietnam, but then you mentioned that there was limited visibility for some other direct and indirect effects, and I just wondered if you could sort of tell me a little bit more about some that you might have seen around the world. Um, so, for example, uh, in Afghanistan, there's a fuel storage site um, in a near village called Stana, where um, a Russian ex-military rocket fuels, there was an ex-helicopter base, has been sort of just left. Um, 
and so a lot of local farmers have been using the area without me realising there's sort of been some reason lots of the barrels have degraded and that's causing them to the ground. That's kind of one example of the issues of abandoned weapons, abandoned stock piles. Um, Sorry, and what's possibly the most shocking example you've yeah. seen and just how widespread is it? <laughs> well, I get the most shocking I found were the hotspot problems highlighted by Europe in Iraq actually because that's, it's, it's an industrialised nation so there's lots of industrial activity throughout the country and the chaos of war totally destabilised that and so therefore just, uh, you know, mentioned potentially thousands of hotspots of contamination there um, and the issues of environmental governance is massive, the issues that you know, the new environment ministry is set up there but it's, it has really limited capacity and so over five years of work you know, we're able to assess five sites and do some limited cleanup of four of those sites. There's thousands, you know, um, and some of those were scrapyards where lots of lots of like lots and lots of um, burnt out tanks that have some of them will have like PCBs, which is a part of sort of lead back that lead batteries. Um, you've got UXOs, sort of unexploded ordnance. You've got sort of weapons residues like think uranium tanks. Been, all that stuff is on the scrap metal, and a lot of it wasn't properly supervised. So, um, scrap, scrap metal became quite a lucrative industry. And this fund is now the Jordan and in Afghanistan as well. So, scrap metal markets have started up outside bases, but lots of this stuff hasn't been properly assessed. It's crossing borders and being uh, mixed into um, non contaminated, uh, like civilian scrap and mixed. So, there's massive problems with governance um, and sort of. Waste management, I think, is a very mundane issue. Waste management, but actually, has significant impact. I think there's 11 million tons was an estimate from one army official in Iraq of hazardous waste in 2009, um, and a lot of that wasn't properly disposed of. There's also the issue of the use of private military security contractors. So they were um, responsible for a lot of the um, support activity of the U.S. Army in Iraq, and so because often contracts were given to one company. They had um, and there was limited oversight and limited capacity. I think there might be one contracting officer, so the officer in the army that monitors contractor work for like I, I can't remember what the number was, but it was like far more than you'd be able to really oversight. I think it might be even hundreds of contractors. Um, and there's many stories in this sort of Green Warriors report from the rank operation of subcontractors taking houses, waste and sort of dumping this stuff in local rivers and then selling it to market. So while each incident is small, the combination of those incidents again, uh, across the country is, is huge and you know, potentially widespread, severe and long term, but you know, because they're all very small um, small events. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I, actually I'd, I'd probably think conflict waste was probably the most urgent issue that I've seen so far that really needs attention. Hi, um, very sorry to your program. I'm a student at Wales School of Economics and I'm sure I'm working with the grant from the Grant and Research Institute in Climate Change and Environment there. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. I just had um, questions regarding your recommendations, and a lot of what you've talked about is very um, international, mm. it, it oriented in international law. Um, and I was wondering if you guys have looked at it all because in a lot of other industries, um, there, there's a lot of exploration about safer alternatives right now, and I was wondering if you guys looked into technological solutions at all, and whether or not there were safer alternatives to toxic emissions. Or is this something militaries are even looking at? Is this something that's on the table anywhere? Um, and are you guys, you know, have you guys explored this in any fashion? Um, yeah, it's been um, green warfare. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 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 um, yeah, there's been uh, quite a lot of work done. The there was concern about um, heavy metals exposure at firing ranges, particularly, and uh, there was work done on green munitions um, for ranges. Um, it has been quite complicated. The Norwegians developed a replacement round, uh, but then it turned out to actually be unexpectedly toxic. And it's, and it's been a similar case with depleted uranium as well, but there was one uh, tungsten alloy which was being used, which then turned out to be highly carcinogenic, more, more so than DU. So it's quite complicated to work out uh, the risk. But um, increasingly we're seeing that some militaries have been driven primarily by uh, national environmental regulations. So if they wanted to fire on ranges on domestic territory, they need to ensure they have a clear idea of their emissions and potential groundwater pollution and air pollution. And that's and also potentially, potential court cases as well are driving them to green up their uh, uh, materials and things. In the US particularly, have got uh, quite good 
seven phase uh, toxicological screening process which they're developing for munitions um, and trying to get an international standard. NATO as well are currently working on uh, less toxic obscurants um, and that's a, a working group which Turkey and the US are leading on I think and which uh, we'll publish in a couple of years I think. So yeah there's work going on but it's as Anika indicated it's not really civilian focused as such. They look at the risks of their own troops but not necessarily the risks that civilians may face from the use of those weapons. Yeah, some, some years ago when the US Army had its new slogan, Army Strong, the uh, environment, US Army's Environmental Policy Institute slogan was Army Strong, Army Green. <laughs> um, but they did do quite a bit of work at the same time. It was very focused specifically on, on military operations and on the civilians, but that would be uh, a good place to look. Um, anyone else? This, this is a problem, um, I think, with, with um, looking at the R&D side of this. I mean, it's true. Can I just add a follow-up to that? Because it was one of the questions I was going to ask, but it sort of ties in with that. Because one of the things that struck me when you put up that chart with the three cases, the, the Iraq War, Hezbollah, Kosovo, and where actual compensation had to be paid, the only case was when it was the loser who paid. Um, so basically, it was either winners or drawers um, in the other cases who, who ended up not paying compensation. But Iraq, uh, because of the oil spill releases, and they ended up coming out of their oil revenue. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. They also had the revenues to be able to pay. Mm -hmm. um, I think, well, the need to pay is lots of content that comes from environmental legislation, and it's this question of can the reason they've used it is because there's this idea of, well, what's, what's acceptable in peacetime? Can it be acceptable in wartime? It's kind of like a little a push or urge to see how that works. Um, in terms of camp, like in terms of paying for cleanup, like as I said, a lot of these things are um, shared responsibilities, as well as some cases where there's quite obvious, uh, quite obvious belligerent actor. Um, and I think there needs to be a, a combination. So in the landmines and cluster munitions sort of work, there's a combination of um, international assistance and assistance from various governments and states around the world to support, as well as those that are the user states to also financially contribute and provide information and transparency. And so they've kind of managed to um, ensure that those that have used weapons or could create the conduct, um, the, yeah, undertaken the, the action, contribute in some way, as well as the international community also filling in. Um, obviously, the real, the real politics of the situation is going to be a really hard one. And of course, I mean, there's a lot of powerful states which are saying, no. <laughs> but if there could be some way of leveraging the humanitarian, um, you know, real urgency of this, um, there's perhaps some key, I don't think the admin thing. Yeah, I think there's 
two aspects, I suppose. It depends on how you want to unpack pay. There's obviously financial reparations, but one way to look at it would be an obligation to ensure that the extent of emissions and pollution caused by conflict are better understood and that assistance is directed. So instead of just the financial compensation or something, it's actually uh, in terms of an action to help alleviate any impacts that may come from it. Um, it's also notable that um, when you look at UN Environment Programme's post-conflict environmental assessments, it's never the belligerents who are paying for them. It's always a group of states like Switzerland and Ireland, Finland and others who are putting their hands in their pocket to pay for these assessments. So at the moment it does seem to be very much out of balance that those who are polluting in these contexts aren't being held financially liable for them. Uh, but yeah, a difficult argument to uh, <laughs> progress internationally, I think. But. And also you briefly mentioned non-state groups. And that is going to be very difficult. How are you going to work <laughs> Any ideas yet? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's in a couple of weeks ago we were at a conference in The Hague um, where Mary Jacobson, who's an independent expert, sort of said to this group of quite eminent international lawyers, and, so they've got ideas on how we deal with non international conflicts, and everyone avoided the question. Tumbleweed. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible how difficult that, that, that issue is. Um, well, there has been examples in the mind ban work of creating um, declarations that non state actors sign up to, that, you know, there, there are some ways of trying to gain accountability there. Um, in terms of private issues through contractors, I kind of think if we're talking about state accountability, then hiring states, host states, and um, affected states could, could be accountable for those those actors and um, working on their behalf. Um, so that's one way of solving that problem. But yeah, the sort of non-state actors are a lot less accountable. It's, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, might be a, a kind of Geneva call type thing to have a, an agreement with non-state actors to allow access for environmental assessment. Efforts that needed to follow it, but um, yeah, in terms of actually avoiding environmental damage, uh, difficult one, I think, particularly yeah, because just because of the range of things. Yeah. Yeah, well, I have two other things I wanted to, to ask about or maybe comment about other than comments rather than questions. Um, but one is, have you looked at the sort of um, transnational geopolitical, you, you talked a little bit about the U.S.-Vietnam um, relations and, and how the uh, compensation of the Agent Orange was, was part of that bilateral relationship, but in, in a broader sense, I was thinking specifically in terms of um, nuclear testing, where you know, the United States uh, cleared off entire populations off of the Pacific Islands. Um, and what kind of compensation mechanisms there are there, and also in terms of uh, the post-Soviet breakup, where you had environmental damage that was caused by Soviet military activities that's now in other countries, and things like UK military testing in Australia. I think Australia here might have some views on that. Um, so that was one. That was one sort of general point to throw out. Um, but the other one was to get back to this idea of you know the general, the the military are focused on war fighting, and they want to win. That's their goal. That's their mission. Um, but it isn't just environmental issues where that's a problem. One of the problems with Iraq is that there was no uh, no plan to govern Iraq after you know it was a brilliant military victory and then it fell apart within weeks uh, because there hadn't been planning. And um, you know, even after uh, ten years, these issues still haven't been solved in terms of the civil military relationship and the diplomats talking to the generals and things. But it seems to me that environmental issues have to be part of that conversation as well. And rather than specific, uh, um, focusing specifically on an environmental issue, it needs to be subsumed under the broader mm -hmm. sense of, of strategic planning um, and you know, preventing blowback and all that kind of stuff, thinking, thinking beyond the end of conflict uh, and into the conflict period. Um, so it's, it's a much, much uh, broader, more abstract problem than specifically getting the general opinion on my um, So I guess it's more of a conflict question. <laughs> I'd be interested in your views on that. Um, yeah, I think one thing we've been looking at at the moment is the drawdown in Afghanistan, where the US are 
burning, <laughs> uh, destroying a lot of their mine protected vehicles because it's too expensive to export them back. There's no market for them. So these vast numbers of mine protected vehicles are going to be destroyed and dumped within Afghanistan. And the Afghans are uh, keen for there to be some environmental responsibility from ISAF as the forces draw down. So I think, it, I think one of the keys for us is to consider all these different opportunities where environmental thinking could be improved in different parts. It's, it's, you know, it's such a broad thing that uh, yeah, it's going to be almost piecemeal, <laughs> but just trying to get these environmental considerations to the forefront and I think be able to classify them under this general term of toxic remnants and war will help sort of focus that thinking. Yeah. So geopolitics, like if there is one section of the report where I look at um, examining the contrast of the US, um, SOFA agreements, that states of forced agreements and military bases in different countries and different approaches taken in the US bases in Germany and, and those in the Philippines or South Korea, Panama, those be a different approach to how to um, provide um, leave bases having done any decontamination work or assessment work or releasing information. Um, so yeah, there is some information in there. And that sort of stuff. It is definitely an area that we need to look more into, I think, expanding to the geopolitical frameworks. I think that was also a recommendation from the folks who were working on natural resources that as soon as you can show that um, the poor management of natural resources are actually a trigger for further conflict and further instability, then the US and others donors suddenly get quite interested. And um, we need to think a little bit about how uh, toxic remnants might be the same thing and the yeah, societal and social mm. and political legacy of some of these contaminants. So it's something we've seen a little bit with depleted uranium in Iraq that became this huge political issue because it's become this huge political issue that's not been dealt with properly because it's been used by opposition parties to beat the <laughs> parties in power and as a result no one really wants to touch it or go near it because it's too much of a hot potato of sorts. So we do have these political legacies of these pollution incidents I think which yeah, we need to look into more. There's also a really clear um, in reading the Green Warriors report um, from Rand Corporation that you know, the, uh, I think the major finding of that report, which is sort of funded by the US government, was that um, the environmental behaviour of, of the army was creating further instability in the country and a lot less um, sort of, yeah, support for, for the US sort of occupation. And that was a real major problem. And, and lots of attempts to do reconstruction work in um, I can't remember which city it was, it might have been in the region, they were sort of attempting to do lots of waste for uh, um, reconstruction of the sort of sewage facilities, but yeah, the, the way it was done with the private leash security contractors meant that the work wasn't done so well and it created further problems. And there was another example of a, a police academy that, you know, um, a new police academy was built, but because it had been subcontracted so far down, the, the work done was really done in a very shoddy way. Um, and it meant that after a few months, it was really quite awful. There was kind of like fecal matter coming through the wall because the sewer system had been designed so badly, and it just creates further anger at, at what happens. There's a real need, and I like it. It would be much, very much in the interests of states doing undertaking these actions to have a better environmental ethic that support their their, um, their operations. And I think I think the US might have learnt that um, through its conducting work. We'll see what happens in Afghanistan. We drill down into it work to sort of push, and push for more awareness of, of that fact. Yeah. The military saying that USAID's role, were they 
they've taken that on board. I'm, I'm just thinking of Dan, because for example, in the, in the 60s, in Afghanistan, the USA, they did built a lot of diamonds and won the hearts and minds of the population. And, you know, it is winning hearts and minds has been the man from the system mm -hmm. carried out. But I just wonder whether they sometimes try and reflect responsibility for that. Would you feel that the US have taken that on? I guess it depends on the practice in question and uh, how much, how necessary it's perceived to be. I think, I think the burn pits one is, is quite an interesting one in that respect, that they see it as a real fundamental operational requirement to be able to burn all your stuff when you've got a forward operating base or something that's another option for waste removal or waste management. Um, exactly, because they see the security Yeah. Uh, well, not, no. not so much leaving stuff behind, but uh, just not extracting hazardous waste normally um, and not having that logistics chain in place to be able to remove waste from bases, so instead of just burning everything. But the issue there was more than just because many like even police operations use blankets, but it's about their overuse there. It's sort of okay to use them, there's no other option. But if they're, if, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, the conflict's been going for eight years and there's still blankets, and there's a need to develop. Like some places have developed sort of incinerators or other means of waste disposal, but there was just a um, negligent attitude towards waste disposal that meant that blankets were used for far longer than they needed to be. And the second issue is the fact that things that shouldn't have been burnt in them were burnt in them because there wasn't the expertise on base to separate waste. You know, like the example was pulled out by the government of Canterbury Airport where it gone well, was where there, was, there happened to be someone on, on the base that had an engineering background and knew to separate waste and he had the capacity of the team to do it, which meant that they managed to not not um, just throw everything in, whereas in other bases they just didn't have the capacity or the expertise. Therefore, there was a cursory look at the pile, yeah, that's okay, we'll put it in. And that meant that hazardous waste, human body parts, tired plastics, all the stuff you've never open burned in this country at all were being burned for eight years. And it's not just, yeah, the troop, troop health has been a real major issue. It's kind of like the second Vietnam and America at the moment veterans returning from war with real health problems from that. There's also civilian contractors that are contracted by companies to work on bases. And the thing that no one's really looking at is whether the sort of residential populations around these bases are also impacted, which is difficult to put that thing comes back to failing limbs and, and that sort of thing. But I think, yeah, what, what gets me is that while there is some arguments for military imperative, there's a lot of stuff that's just about negligence that you really need to like put up a scratch into the information. <laughs> Maybe add uh, something you just said or uh, follow on creating mm -hmm. around Gulf War syndrome. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's the connection that was made in the kind of anti war campaign community between the coup in the and then the birth of the in Iraq. Does your work intersect or assess the connection between the um, two? Yeah, I think it's a it's something which doesn't really suit simplistic explanations. I think, like for a Gulf War syndrome itself, you know, there was so many different exposures, and being able to determine which of those multiple exposures may have caused that health effect down the line you know, is incredibly difficult. In the case of birth defects in Iraq, again, there are a wide range of environmental risk factors, and the work that has been done so far has been very highly criticised. Um, the Iraqi government is concerned about taking criticism because of the lack of health care provision and you know, it's been a very strange thing to watch politically. The WHO have refused to sign up to sign the report uh, that they worked on with the Iraqis. The Iraqis claimed it was extensively peer reviewed. The peer reviewers said we had two hours to look at it <laughs> and that was it. Um, and also about with the, the detail and quality of the report that you know, if you're looking at environmental risk factors then chances are you may need to look in quite a fine-grained way at communities because there may be only subsections of the community who may have been exposed to a problem uh, or a particular risk factor in the environment and nationwide or regional wide studies aren't really going to give you that detail and that's something we sort of discussed in the toxic harm paper that um, it's very difficult to draw direct links from environmental risk factors to particular health outcomes. You know, asbestos is an unusual thing because it has a specific cancer associated with it, but stuff like DU where you might have density for lung cancer or lymphoma or leukemia, you know, there can be multiple causes for that and also relatively no, low numbers, so they're fairly rare diseases as they are, so you need really good fine-grained detailed public health analysis and epidemiology and that's something which we never really see post-conflict. And 
one of the issues is that we need more work on sort of agreed and clear methodologies for these post-conflict public health assessments um, and more implementation of those surveys. And, but we can also talk about potential risks from these substances. You know, it's not rocket science. We know they're chemically toxic. We know they're long-lived in the environment. We know they're radioactive. We know exposure to these things are generally agreed to be a bad thing. And the levels of them in the environment need to be assessed and the risk to people determined. So there's a, a, a tangential follow-up to that, because we were talking um, before the event started about how long some of these materials persist in the environment. I asked specifically uh, in connection with that Omaha Beach study, if the, uh, the fleet of uranium had been in use at the time, you know, would that have persisted down 50 to 70 years? And your answer effectively was no. But um, of, of the various different um, POWs that you're talking about, including the UX as, as well as, as the um, particular contaminants, which ones have a sort of a longer um, term impact, you know, on the decade, scale of decades? I'm just going to chip that question over to our, <laughs> our scientists. Yeah, there. so, so there's things like uh, PCBs, polychlorinated polyphenols. Um, they are they are highly persistent. There's uh, the convention running their use uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, they are highly uh, bioaccumulative, uh, highly very, very persistent. It can take some can take hundreds of years to break down. Same with um, dioxins, which are actually a breakdown product from eating vaporization. It happens when um, areas are bombarded. Um, they also know which is the ongoing clean up around Agent Orange as well, that's why it's such a big deal, it's because um, the surface system has been in the environment for so long, you know, pose a risk for, for possibly hundreds of years. Um, many organics as well, you know, many of these things that you talk about have been banned or prevented from use or reduced in, from being used in peacetime situations. But that's when they crop up in some of these sort of conflict scenarios, it's not always a thing about exemption, but in some countries, they still like in Gaza, they're still using asbestos in some situations, um, still using PCBs in power stations, in uh, transistors, and things like that. Um, we've, been they're, they're things, that's it. we've been looking at heavy metals in World War One as well. Yeah, heavy metals in World War One. Actually, I was going to jump in there when you're talking about the shrapnel on the beaches. Um, there's been some areas of uh, northern France and Belgium. Uh, West Belgium, um, where it's been suggested that they stop using some of the land for agriculture. This has been an 80, 90 year legacy of um, contamination, and there's a risk that that could actually, um, you know, make its way into the food chain. Again, there's obviously way back then we were talking about um, post conflict health studies. Um, but also in Croatia, it's quite interesting, 15 years after the conflict there. Um, they found um, heavy metal uh, contamination in drinking waters, in foods such as uh, vegetables like cabbages, cauliflowers, uh, it's sort of staple, staple foods and diet there. Uh, and also in humans as well, it's been they found um, heavy metals such as lead, tin, copper, zinc, um, in blood, hair, and urine 15 years later. So it's, we didn't go far enough to say what those health impacts were, but there's the green exposure there, so heavy metals is a key as well. Thank you. Okay, well, we're, we're past our officially allotted time, but I'm perfectly happy to keep going as long as other people are, if anyone has any further questions. Mm -hmm. what, is that your question? What time is left? Yeah. <laughs> What about the global health security aspects of all this? I mean, it seems to me there's a clear interest, um, obviously. Um, but are you looking for a, a sort of effective network putting together? Or do you see yourself kind of standing around the town? Is that going to sound like a We'll be looking for a global network. <laughs> <laughs> I think if the uh, past experience from other similar campaigns and to go by. I think in the short to medium term it'll be a fairly small network with bringing together different specialisms and then ultimately it's going to need to be a large global network to leverage the political pressure that we need to be able to get some progress I think. Um, but up until then, yeah, we're bringing together 
sort of humanitarian disarmament side, landmine people, because they're actually quite interested in going beyond just the exploding stuff. You know, they're returning fields that have been cleared from landmines, but how much, uh, what a level of explosives or heavy metals left in the soils after landmines, aged landmines have been there and new. And uh, it's very interesting going slightly beyond that and doing more environmental assessments in the course of their work. Um, public health people, again, um, which is an area which, I mean, our backgrounds are all environmental, so it's been quite useful. The last couple of days have been had some good conversations on ways of improving public health monitoring and recording of public health problems uh, from environmental contaminants. And also bringing in environmental campaigns as well, who've uh, yeah, got a lot of complementary experience in going solely on environmental issues. So. Uh, I think the big question is where is it going to be <coughs> resolved or sorted because there's no current forum particularly for dealing exactly with this. You know, we've been to the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons in Geneva. Um, so it's got its protocol on explosive remnants of war, but this doesn't quite fit and the diplomats you get there aren't necessarily particularly well grounded in human rights or environmental issues. Um, the, U, the new structure for the UN Environment Programme, the UN Environment Assembly, might be somewhere of interest for the wider conflict and environment brief, I think. Uh, but yeah, it remains to be seen, and we're sort of taking it one step at a time. And going on with that, for you guys, is that at all there's like, there's a lot of things about, I mean, for example, with the United States, you could, you could be discussing it with that if you had not already about whether or not you know, legislation to regulate conduct and, you know, burn in pits, that sort of thing. Um, have you guys pursued that at all? Or? Um, not directly. I mean, there is work being done, particularly around the burn pits issue. The uh, Centre for Constitutional Rights has been doing quite a lot of work around that. Um, beyond that, no, we're not really at the I talk to legislators stage as yet. It's um, more been environment ministries and foreign affairs and mm -hmm. things so far. Uh, but yeah, it will come. I don't, it, uh, there might be particular practices where a national legislative approach might be interesting or relevant, but I think most of it is going to have to be uh, on the um, international side, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm thinking, because Big Bang would obviously be international, but I think you could maybe go, you know, a little bang for your buck by doing a legislative approach. I mean, mm -hmm. I come from a legislative background, <laughs> working in a legislature, so never underestimate the power of a few um, you know, passionate individuals who can change in the legislature. So, um, you know, obviously the end goal I could see would absolutely be international law, but it could be potentially could start with. Some of that stuff's already happening in the US, um, like, like Doug said, around burn pits, and um, actually taking some cases to national courts that kind of this sort of. Uh, these issues being translated into national law and contracts, contract litigation essentially, did, did those companies follow their contracts or did they not and put people at harm, which is another interesting angle of the law that we have only started looking at recently, um, both that specific to purpose security contractors mm -hmm. as opposed to state actors. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry that we didn't have more people here, but I think we had a very fruitful discussion. It's, with it's their loss. <laughs> yes, absolutely. As far as I'm concerned, it was worth it coming in all the way from the island.